So my um, my paper is uh, is entitled uh, "Dispute Settlement in the South China Sea from Joint Phone Ops to Joint Proceedings," um, and this paper tries to engage um, with the the framework um, the, this framework of thought that we're given uh, with regard to the application of UNCLOS uh, and dispute settlement in particular. But what I'm trying to do here is to go beyond UNCLOS, beyond uh, the dispute settlement proceedings that we've seen so far, and to see how we can really go from these bilaterals um, to a more uh, multi-party approach. Um, and um, first I'll start with uh, assessing the current situation, uh, which brought me to um, bring up these points today. Um, and also, um, as a way to define the terms more precisely, uh, when I use the word dispute settlement, this is in a broad sense. Um, so obviously I'm talking about arbitrations under uh, Annex 7, uh, but I'm also talking about the opportunities for participation uh, at the uh, ICJ, at ITLOS, um, even if those are not as relevant uh, in the South China Sea as of now. Um, and um, first, uh, looking at the current situation, um, I identified three important points. Uh, first was the failure of the ASEAN framework. Um, several of the speakers uh, have talked um, to extent extensive lengths about this. Uh, about how the declaration of conduct was not followed by uh, an effective code of conduct um, and how um, the different negotiation rounds uh, did not ultimately result in any meaningful progress on the resolving these disputes in the South China Sea. Um, second is the military buildup, uh, which many speakers have described, uh, as well as the freedom of navigation operations uh, that have been conducted by the U.S. in particular, uh, but not only. Uh, and I will touch upon these um, operations further. Um, and then, from a dispute settlement point of view, uh, one of the only significant developments was the uh, PC arbitration between Philippines and China, uh, the case number uh, 2013-19. So I, um, I've already touched upon the failure of the ASEAN framework. Here are some of the important um, mi milestones. Um, and um, an important point to keep in mind is, as some of the speakers noted, was that China has now an agreement with Brunei, Cambodia, and Laos uh, to only negotiate these disputes in a bilateral framework, um, which uh, obviously circumvents um, part of the effort to make this a multi-party um, a multi-party approach. Um, going back to the phone ops, um, some of the speakers touched upon this. It's codified in UNCLOS 871A, um, and the it's the simplest way to define it is that the ships uh, flying the flag of a sovereign state uh, shall not suffer interference from other states. Uh, and this was stated in uh, the U.S. Oceans Policy in 1983, um, and it's been uh, systematically reasserted. Um, if you've listened to um, uh, Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter uh, recently, uh, he makes these types of statements uh, quite often. Um, and some, some of the interesting developments recently were uh, signs that Australia, Japan, and the Philippines have either conducted or expressed their interest in conducting phone ops in the South China Sea. Um, and um, we know that for some of them, they already have started conducting these phone ops, uh, especially for Australia. Um, and the Philippines has just agreed on uh, conducting such operations with the US Navy, um, which shows that we are really expanding beyond the scope of um, these bilaterals, we're moving to a point where we're trying to include all of the different parties inside in order to um, perhaps uh, have a more successful outcome in these um, proceedings. Um, and uh, just to show you what the um, US Department of Defense uh, two weeks ago uh, just published its uh, fiscal year 2015 report on uh, these phone ops, uh, and they, um, they list them in a um, in a uh, alphabetical, 
alphabetical order, um, and this is uh, for China, you can see what the types of excessive maritime claims uh, that are being contested. Um, and I, I compared this with the 2014 uh, iteration, uh, and um, what's been added since then um, is the prior permission required for innocent passage of foreign military ships through the territorial sea. Uh, but other than that, in 2014, the US had uh, the same concerns. Um, I've also highlighted the other, uh, some of the other uh, South China Sea claimants, um, what their excessive claims are, because one of the uh, main tenets of the US phone ops is that um, it does not target a specific country. Uh, this is really about upholding freedom of navigation. Um, so we see that Malaysia, Philippines, uh, Vietnam as well. Um, and so um, moving on now, um, the PCA arbitration, as I said, is the only significant dispute settlement uh, development that we've seen. Uh, and I won't go into all the details that some of the speakers um, have gone into. This is the um, arbitral panel, uh, the five arbitrators, uh, very distinguished. Um, and so looking at this current situation, uh, I've, I asked myself uh, several questions. Um, and the first one was how can, can these uh, South China Sea claimants and stakeholders utilize the dispute settlement mechanisms under UNCLOS and under other frameworks uh, to, to their fullest potential? Uh, and second, uh, how can they translate increasing levels of cooperation into legal actions? Um, and finally, how can these claimants overcome non-participation, forceful bilateralism, and bring parties uh, into compliance, uh, China in particular? Um, and my outline is the following. Um, I'll first look at the uh, procedural opportunities um, in South China Sea dispute settlement mechanisms, um, not in UNCLOS, but not only. And then um, I'll show how this is really about bringing uh, what I would call strategic litigation uh, in the South China Sea. So first, um, the available fora under UNCLOS, um, Ms. Hong uh, mentioned these very well, so I won't go into the details. This is the Article 287, uh, the ICJ, ITLOS, uh, an Annex 7 arbitration, uh, Annex 7 arbitration being the default solution. Uh, and here, um, as Ms. Hong rightly pointed out, none of the South China Sea claimants have elected uh, one of these uh, mechanisms, which makes Annex 7 the default solution. However, we should not necessarily neglect the other uh, fora, such as the ICJ and ITLOS, um, First, because um, China might, um, might in the future accept the jurisdiction of one of these, uh, of one of these um, fora. And second, um, other South China Sea claimants are not precluded from using these fora for resolving the disputes between themselves. Um, these are some of the re relevant articles that I'm going to go over. Um, and um, so moving to my first uh, part on the potential for third party participation in joint proceedings. Uh, and here I need to define some of the ter terms because uh, when you're talking about international law, international dispute settlement, a lot of these terms will come up and they don't necessarily mean the same thing in the same context. Um, so what I'm talking about joint proceedings, uh, this is in a broad sense, uh, which means that I encompass situations where parties are either joining a dispute uh, as a party to the dispute or intervening, uh, maybe as a third party, uh, submitting uh, some evidence in writing, sub submitting uh, some memoranda. Um, it's the same when we're talking about third party or third person. Uh, in some instances, a third party might be considered, um, especially if you have a capital P, usually it means that this is a party to the treaty. However, in some other treaties, um, especially in investor state arbitration, we have situations where a third party will be a party which is not a party to the treaty, so a private person. Um, you also come across the terms interested party, non-disputing party, 
Uh, amicus curiae is an important word uh, in these proceedings. It means friend of the court in Latin. Um, and this is a, um, usually this is a, a letter or a um, submission to the court uh, as a friend of the court to help the court in order to adjudic adjudicate some of the claims. Um, we've also seen in the context of the South China Sea, the notes verbal, which are originally diplomatic notes, uh, but what ha which have become relevant as well in dispute settlement because they might be taken into account by tribunals. Uh, and also unilateral statements. Uh, Vietnam uh, made one of these statements in 2014 uh, through its prime minister and it's uh, the PCA uh, panel uh, actually incorporated this statement into their um, written, uh, written evidence that they were considering. Um, so going back to the ICJ, uh, these are two of the relevant articles that deal with um, the participation by interested parties. Um, so this is for um, interested state parties. Um, uh, and here are some of the cases in which the ICJ authorized uh, this participation, uh, but it never did so in a, um, really I would say in a comprehensive manner. It, there were always reservations and this is often the case in dispute settlement. Tribunals will rarely allow third parties or even interested state parties to really have uh, full access to the proceedings. They will usually allow them to intervene for specific points of law or of fact. Um, so here are some of the, these cases. Uh, and as I said, there is limited success for either intervention from state parties or uh, third party intervention. Uh, and here I should just go back on one of the um, items that were, was mentioned by uh, previous speakers that ICJ dispute settlement is based on the consent of both parties. Uh, so here in the South China Sea, as long as China refuses the jurisdiction of the ICJ, it has never submitted itself to an ICJ um, um, panel, uh, then we won't be able to use it. However, other, um, some of the other uh, South China Sea claimants might have recourse to the ICJ. Um, Second, uh, ITLOS, um, this is uh, one of the relevant articles that's in the UNCLOS, Article 31, Request to Intervene. Uh, and this is just one of the cases I noted where uh, you actually have two parties, uh, the Southern Bluefin Tuna case, um, two parties, Australia and New Zealand, uh, bringing a claim against Japan. Uh, and here the two parties were considered as having the same interest. Uh, and so they're, um, in a way, their, um, their participation in this proceeding was as if they were one party. Uh, but it does show how even in these proceedings, you might have um, a multiplication of different parties. And maybe one day in the South China Sea, we could hopefully see some of the parties come together. And if they agree on some points, maybe uh, coalesce some of their claims. Um, I also looked at Amicus Curiae under ITLOS. Um, these are two examples of um, attempts to submit amicus curiae by, uh, by the Greenpeace. Uh, the first one was in case number 17, uh, the responsibilities and obligations of states sponsoring persons and entities with respect to activities in their international seabed area. Um, and then the second one was for the Arctic Sunrise case, which I'll go back to later on because it's, it's also a, an interesting case in the South China Sea context because Russia also refused to participate in these proceedings. Uh, but just to go back to um, these uh, amicus curiae submissions um, and the um, both cases, uh, ITLOS refused um, to allow the uh, amicus curiae submission. Um, and it was in fact the, the first time uh, in the context of ITLOS where it really set this precedent. However, it did publish uh, the amicus curiae on its website. Uh, which shows that even if a, par a third party is not granted access to the proceedings, it might still have an impact. And this is important in the context of the South China Sea, uh, where we've seen Vietnam um, in particular interested in perhaps intervening or participating. Um, then we have UNCLOS Annex 7, uh, which is obviously the most relevant for us. Uh, I mentioned the Vietnamese submission, but there's also been a Taiwanese submission, which is here on the right. Um, and um, 
both of these submissions, um, um, well, the, the Vietnamese statement is, in fact, a, a statement. It's not really a proper amicus curiae. However, as I said, it was incorporated into the PCA's uh, decision-making process. Um, and as a general matter, uh, I should note that amicus briefs are usually only authorized um, when uh, they meet several criteria, um, when, they are, when they deal with a matter within the scope of the dispute, uh, when the party submitting the amicus curiae has a significant interest, uh, when it can assist in resolving a factual or legal question, and also sometimes if it is independent from the parties in the dispute. Um, so I'm going to move along. Um, so this was uh, another submission. Um, I'm going to move to creative approaches beyond UNCLOS because this is a very important, um, I think, a very important field which hasn't really been explored um, because, as was mentioned by some previous speakers, um, we've seen success in promoting compliance uh, in other areas such as international trade. Uh, at the WTO, uh, China has been a very willing party, has participated. Um, obviously, and at the end of the year, um, there's a question of whether China will qualify as a market economy status, which will have a strong impact on uh, probably the way it sees the WTO after this. Uh, but in any case, this is an example, a successful example, in which um, a dispute settlement, a binding dispute settlement proceeding uh, is accepted uh, by China. Um, there's also a question of bringing investor state disputes in the South China Sea. Um, we've seen a rise in the use of state-owned organizations uh, in investor state arbitration. That, that's a, a very contentious issue. Uh, however, there's been significant scholarship um, on this particular issue and showing that this is really an increasing trend. Um, and, and particular, uh, I went to look at some of the BITs, the bilateral investment treaties between some of the parties. And so I looked at the China-Vietnam BIT, um, and um, here in the Articles 3 and 4, we have some of the standards of protection. Um, there's the standard of full protection and security. Um, so on the left are just some of the standard protections you find in most of these agreements. Full protection and security, national treatment, most favored nation, no expropriation without compensation. Um, so these all offer possible avenues for South China Sea claimants. Um, and um, the China has accepted to submit itself to some ICSID arbitrations. ICSID is the body of the World Bank, which administers some of these disputes. Um, so this is another avenue for parties, um, claimants, or in private parties, which wish to have an impact here. And within the global context of lawfare, this is an important thing to keep in mind. Um, I'll just quickly go over the rationale of these, um, of maybe initiating these proceedings or participating. Um, the US phone up rationale, uh, as I said, uh, there are several different tenets that are here. Uh, but the, the, re the real idea is to bring strategic litigation. Uh, and st strategic litigation is an American concept um, which was developed, usually um, we refer to it when we think about the civil rights era, Brown versus Board of Education. And it's about bringing systemic change um, through litigation. And here I believe that we can bring systemic change, uh, perhaps, through litigating, through participation by some of the other um, South China Sea claimants. Um, yep. And um, some of the perspectives in light of um, this, uh, the arbitration case at the PCA, uh, it is important to keep in mind that China submitted a position paper, which is quite extensive, uh, 90 paragraphs, um, and which deals with a lot of, um, they try to rebut a lot of the um, jurisdictional arguments of uh, the Philippines. and. Um, so, and for me, this is the, the functional equivalent of a counter memorial. Um, and um, in effect, China did, in a way, join itself to the proceeding uh, through this submission. Um, but other claimants may also send um, briefs to, um, to the um, Annex 7 panels, uh, such as uh, Vietnam did through its statement that was incorporated. Uh, and this was on 
uh, February 6, 2015. Um, and this shows, uh, just to conclude, the value of the process. Um, it's the process itself that uh, really is the key here. Um, all the speakers during these two days have shown that dispute resolution alone is not going to bring any change, and we're probably not gonna, actually going to see any enforceable awards in the future. However, if all the uh, South China Sea claimants, or at least a strong um, a, a number of them, bring claims, show their commitment to the process, this could actually um, really bring some of the systemic change that I was talking about. And this is not only for um, claimants in the South China Sea, it's also for third par party um, organizations. Uh, think about the fisheries, the oil and gas industry. Um, and this is really about looking at this um, from a creative um, point of view and showing that we can really move from joint freedom of navigation operations, which kind of exemplify um, military might, um, but we can use the same tactics here in the context of dispute settlement. Uh, and this is the Peace Palace in The Hague. It's really nice. I recommend if everyone wanna, wants to go there. Uh, and it's where both the PCA and the ICJ are seated. They're right across the hall. So uh, thank you very much. Uh,